Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Not a good afternoon? <laughs> anyway, I'm Eckhard Grohl. I'm uh, the Perry head of the School of Mechanical Engineering, and uh, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to today's uh, Purdue Engineering uh, Distinguished Lecturer Series, uh, a very special seminar that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. Uh, with uh, strong connections to mechanical engineering, and that's why I'm here to kick things off. Uh, so it's my distinct pleasure, as the start of this program, to introduce uh, the current interim dean of engineering. Uh, that is, of course, uh, Mark Landstrom, who is also the Don and Carol Cyphers uh, Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And if you uh, uh, followed Mark's uh, steps that he was an acting dean a little while ago, and then uh, uh, Mung came back in, then Mung became president, so now he's the interim dean again, but he is actually the interim dean for just eight more days. And that means I may be the last one to do an introduction of him. I don't know how many events he have left, but uh, uh, a couple more, okay. But it is definitely a distinct pleasure because I love working uh, with Mark. Uh, he has been a wonderful uh, boss to me, and uh, he said to keep it brief, so with uh, no further ado, Mark Landstrom, the Interim Dean of uh, College of Engineering. But this is my last time introducing the Distinguished Lecture Series. So, and um, you know, these have been a real treat. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture. I, I always look forward to these afternoons in the middle of a busy week. It's a chance to hear from a leading expert on an important topic, uh, often outside of our own particular areas of expertise, but always thought-provoking and interesting, and the panel discussion that follows is also terrific, too. So today, we're, we're fortunate to have with us Professor Esther Taguchi, uh, Taguchi from the Stony Brook University and Brookhaven National Laboratory. Professor Taguchi will be talking about a topic of great importance, um, batteries, and the electrochemistry of batteries. And of course, we all know how critical batteries are for portable electronic devices, for uh, increasingly for electric vehicles, and for use in inherently intermittent power sources such as solar and wind. Batteries are complex systems that present many interesting scientific challenges. Uh, we'll be hearing about some of those in, in Professor Taguchi's lecture. And then we'll take a very short break, so don't go away. And then we'll have a panel discussion that follows. And the topic of the panel discussion will be what's next in batteries. So with that, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Esther Taguchi is a SUNY Distinguished Professor and the William and Jane Knapp Chair in Energy and the Environment at Stony Brook University. She also holds an appointment at the Brookhaven National Laboratory as Chief Scientist and Chair of the Interdisciplinary Science Department. Uh, Dr. Taguchi was previously employed at Great, uh, Great Batch, Inc., where her work was instrumental in developing the lithium silver vanadium oxide battery, which is the power source for implantable cardiac defibrillators. She's a prolific inventor with more than 150 patents. Dr. Taguchi is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Inventors Hall of Fame, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she is a charter member of the National Academy of uh, Innovation, and she was awarded the National Medal of Technology in Innovation and many other awards as well. Dr. Taguchi received a BA from the University of Pennsylvania with a double major in chemistry and history, and a PhD in chemistry from our neighbor in the Midwest, the Ohio State University. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Taguchi? So thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. It's great to be here. Um, as many times as I've been to various places, I've never had the opportunity to come to Purdue, so I'm really delighted to be here today and uh, not only witness the campus, but the enthusiasm of the, the students and faculty alike. So I am going to talk about energy storage today, 
And um, I'm going to put things in a little bit of context. One of the things that's facing the world, really, uh, not just the United States, is the, the whole idea of decarbonization. How do we get to a cleaner environment um, to offset things like uh, carbon change, um, climate change, excuse me. And there was, a, there was a, 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 a study commissioned by the National Academy um, of Engineering, and I participated in that study, to look at if we want to achieve net zero by 2050, what has to happen in the short term? So what has to happen in the next 10 years? And this study is available online, so if you want to Google it and find it, you can download it free. But basically, there's four critical things. And I'm focused here on more the, the technology and science things. There are certainly societal things that have to happen as well, but I'm more focused here on the, on the technical aspects. So we need to electrify almost everything. So transportation, buildings, industry, we need to electrify. Well, in order for that to be it, it, you know, productive, we need to have carbon-free electricity. We need to improve energy efficiency and generally expand innovation in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. So if we look at the emissions by sector, the two biggest sectors have to do with generating electricity and then also transportation. So if you wonder where your emissions are coming from, that's, that's where they're coming from. So let me then segue that into advanced batteries. So why do we need advanced batteries and what critical roles do they play in our society? One is we certainly are aware of portable electronics. I'm sure everybody has, you know, cell phones, laptops, you know, iPads, whatever it is they carry around. Those are lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries are actually a fairly new technology. They were introduced by Sony Corporation in 1992. So many of you weren't born then, but I was. <laughs> and I remember what an unbelievable transformation that was to introduce lithium ion. It was just a huge um, sea change. Implantable batteries is where I spent the first part of my career making life-saving devices for people. The importance of being able to implant a device fully that needs to be powered is any break in the skin, you know, for wires or other things, is a source for infection. So we were committed to making um, medical devices that could allow people to live um, very normal lives and extend their life, extend their quality of life by providing the batteries that could power these devices. So what I'm going to talk about today, however, is transportation and large-scale storage. And if you look at the radar plots along the bottom, what you notice is that while batteries are important, the type of battery and the, and the role, the job that the battery has to do is different. And so whatever battery is going to win the day is the battery that meets the needs of that application better than any other possible solution. So um, those are my icons. So you'll know when I'm talking about transportation, when you'll see the little car, and when I'm talking about the grid, um, you'll see the, the power lines pop up. So from a scientific or engineering perspective, our strategy was to investigate phenomena over multiple scale lengths. Turns out batteries are very complex. You know, we think of them as pretty simple. Oh, well, there's an anode, there's a cathode, you know, one releases electrons, the other one accepts electrons, or some kind of electrolyte and some kind of membrane that separates everything. But the complexity of batteries is such that um, every length scale matters. It turns out that at a molecular level, the structure matters, the particle matters, the aggregation, meaning the nature of the electrode matters, um, as well as the entire system. And much of the work that I'm go going to describe today uh, was done under our Energy Frontier Research Centers. So these are funded by Department of Energy. These are highly collaborative, multi-organization, um, uh, multidisciplinary undertakings. Um, I also wanted to point out, because we recognize the important of bring, importance of bringing together multiple disciplines, that we created an institute to bring together academics, 
national labs as well as industries to really facilitate interaction and hopefully move advanced batteries um, even further um, towards uh, not only invention but commercialization. So let me start with a transportation problem. One of the things that has impeded adoption of electric vehicles is this question of range anxiety and also the anxiety of, oh, it takes me hours and hours and hours to charge my battery. So the challenge that we were facing was, how do you charge a battery effectively in 10 minutes? So today it takes hours, our challenge was 10 minutes. Not only does this allow charging faster, but it saves money because typically today's batteries and cars are over-designed. They're bigger than they need to be to compensate for the fact that you may need hours to charge. And it turns out that in a lithium ion battery, the problem limiting fast charge is that the graphite anode should accept lithium ions, where the ions move back and forth between the anode and the cathode. But instead, if you try to charge too fast, you drive the potential of the negative electrode below the potential of lithium, and you end up plating lithium all over the place. And when you plate lithium, sometimes that lithium becomes ineffective, and basically the batteries. Um, lose capacity and decline pretty fast if you do repeated fast charge. So our strategy was really a, a very fundamental one, you know, fundamental uh, concept in electrochemistry. There's the thermodynamic potential, which means the fundamental nature of a material, but there's something called overpotential, and overpotential is really uh, kinetically driven. How much past my thermodynamic potential do I need to do, go to accomplish something? And our hypothesis was that if we could control that lithium deposition over potential, then we could influence um, and minimize lithium deposition. So that's what we set out to do. And we studied what materials have unfavorable um, deposition for lithium. And it turns out that certain metals, for example, copper and nickel, have unfavorable deposition, and um, we believe it's because there's a mismatch. There's a mismatch in the crystal structure of lithium versus the metal crystal structure. So this means that there's an energy barrier, a kinetic barrier, to trying to deposit lithium. So what we did then was deposited very thin films of either copper or nickel on the surface of the graphite electrodes with the idea that if we can minimize overpotential, then, well, actually in this case, what we're, we're, we're maximizing the overpotential for lithium deposition and minimizing the overpotential for lithium insertion into graphite that we might be able to um, offset some of the lithium deposition. So we did uh, some fundamental studies really looking at lithium deposition and quantifying, and we quantified it through X-ray diffraction, scanning electron microscopy, measuring the capacity or the coulombs driven below uh, zero lithium potential. And sure enough, if we looked at the electrodes that were either copper coated or nickel coated, quantitatively the amount of lithium deposited was much, much less um, compared to the uncoated graphite. So this was looking quite promising. We then moved on to assembling full-scale cells, so these now aren't tiny lab cells, these are pouch cells, where we had an NMC cathode, which is a typical cathode for electric vehicles. We had graphite anodes that we either plated or did not plate with um, nickel or copper, and in fact, um, over many, many cycles, we've run up to 500 cycles, we get significantly improved capacity retention with our metal-coated electrodes. And um, we're excited about this because this is a technology that can be implemented with existing manufacturing processes. So let me move on. So that was kind of a story about the negative electrode. Now I'm going to move on to the story about the positive electrode. Uh, typical, as I mentioned, uh, typical cathode materials are nickel, manganese, cobalt, so often called NMC, and they have a number of uh, crystalline structures. And 
the goal was, can we exploit this material further? Can we use a known material and get more capacity out? And if not, why not? So the amount of energy that you can get out of NMC depends on the lithium content. So if you pull more lithium out by charging it to higher voltage, you can, in fact, get higher capacity. You can get about 20% higher capacity. So we cycled batteries um, at charging to 4.7 versus 4.3 and said, well, you know, the 4.7 ones are degrading a lot. The capacity is fading. And we knew that we had increased impedance. We also observe you know, particle cracking that's a little bit more exaggerated when the materials are at higher um, states of delithiation. So we wanted to understand that more. We did a detailed um, extra diffraction study. So in this case, we're using what's called operando extra diffraction. So operando means we have a working battery and we're measuring it while it's working. So we're getting real time data and we looked at charge to 4.3, we looked at charge to 4.7, um, and what we found out is that, the, that there's much more expansion of the unit cell, so change in volume is significantly exaggerated when you go to 4.7. We wanted to understand this further, and we turned really to kind of fundamental thermodynamics. If you think about, you know, the first law of thermodynamics, when there's a change in energy, there's two things. There's heat and there's work. So if we think about a battery, work is the electrochemistry. So what's the voltage? What's the current? That's going to define the amount of uh, watt hours that we're going to achieve. But then there's heat. Now, battery people often test extensively the work part, right? Cycle, 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 you know, what's happening. But we were interested in the other portion of the equation as well. We wanted to measure the heat to see if we could get insight into what was happening with the batteries. So um, we used a method called isothermal microcalorimetry. So we're keeping the temperature fixed. We're measuring the heat dissipation. And we analyzed the data according to the equation that I'm showing you. We determined the heat dissipation due to polarization, mean, meaning basically voltage drop. We determined the entropic contribution. And what we were interested in was the parasitic heat, meaning everything we can't account for through polarization or entropy. And we studied, these are, again, NMC batteries that were charging to 4.7 or 4.3. And no question about it, we looked at five different cycles at five different current levels. The batteries that were charged at 4.7 dissipate much more heat. It's about a factor of two higher compared to the batteries that are charged to 4.3. So for that 20% gain in capacity, we're dissipating about two times the level of heat. So that gives you some sense that there's a lot going on when you change the, 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 the charge voltage. Um, we looked at what's called the voltage hysteresis and the back and forth voltage profiles, meaning if you charge and discharge, and they follow the exact same voltage profile, it gives you a better sense that things are reversible. And at 4.3 volts, that's the case. At 4.7 volts, that is no longer the case. The trajectory for charge and discharge of the voltage profile is not the same. When we looked at the heat and work uh, contributions, we find out that from a thermodynamic perspective, when we charge to 4.3, the system is largely um, reversible. But when we charge to 4.7, the system is no longer fundamentally reversible. And we plotted to see how much that offset is. So what's appealing about this method is that we can get really um, important information in as little as five cycles. So we don't have to cycle 300 and 500 times to find out that there is a fundamental irreversible, irreversibility going on um, with these batteries. So 
The other thing we were thinking about was, again, if we don't invent a new material, can we improve cell le level usable active material content? Today, the batteries in lithium, or the, the electrodes in lithium ion batteries are really very thin. They're very high surface area and they're thin, and they're thin to maximize transport. We want the ions to be able to move readily. We want the um, electrons to be able to move readily. But if you change how you design the, the cell and change how you package it, if you make a thick electrode, the amount of inert material such as separator current collectors decreases substantially and you can increase the energy content of the battery. But the downside is, so now the ions have further to go, it's fundamentally a transport problem. We have to be able to get the ions to every particle, we have to be able to get the electrons to every particle. So we've spent um, a number of years actually investigating the opportunities to design low tortuosity, thick electrodes with tunable features so the opportunity for increasing cell level energy content can go up, and it's a balance between porosity and energy content, because if it's too porous, then you're also not effectively using space. And uh, we, working in conjunction with um, some of our modeling colleagues, uh, we developed some models where we could really predict as a function of the discharge rate what the voltage profiles would look like for these various electrode designs. And interestingly, when we first started this, we thought that the models would be fairly specific to a given chemical system. But as we started looking more broadly, it turned out that the models were pretty broadly applicable that in a general sense, independent of the chemical system, as long as it's an insertion cathode, these models hold up and we can relate the rate capability and the electrode design for almost um, any chemical system that's, uh, that's relevant. So these are continuum models, I should explain. So now, big shift. Now we're going to grid scale storage. Why is this important? In order to implement solar or wind that are renewable, clean forms of energy generation, you have to have storage. They're too intermittent to just feed directly into the grid at any significant level. The grid actually can't handle it because today's grid doesn't store anything. There's a few places where, you know, you have hydrothermal storage, you know, where they pump water. Um, not hydrothermal, but just, you know, um, water storage, you know, pump it, pump it into a lake and then later go, go through a dam. But geographically, not everybody has a waterfall, so it's not, not universally applicable. So we were interested in storage that would be scalable. We thought about using water rather than flammable electrolytes. And rather than lithium as a negative electrode, we turned to uh, zinc. So the first material we looked at is sodium vanadium oxide, or NVO for short. It's a layered structure. The sodium makes pillars, so we thought that it would be effective in storing zinc. Um, first thing we did was actually synthesize the material. We use a sol gel method. This is an aqueous method that's readily scalable. And we were deliberately controlling the water content. Our hypothesis was that the water content between the vanadium oxide layers would be an important contributor to facilitating zinc ion mobility between these layers. So with the as prepared material, H just means hydrated, there's a lot of water present in these layers. If you heat it to 300, there's a few percent. If we heat it to 500, the material is close to anhydrous, not quite, but close to anhydrous. So we have three different material systems that, that we explored. It also affects the morphology. After heating, the material turns into nano rods, and at a higher temperature, the nano rods become uh, thicker, bigger. 
We started running electrochemistry of our three different materials and saw that um, the reversibility in terms of electrochemical reversibility was different for the three materials. And by electrochemical reversibility, what I'm really looking at is delta, delta um, E peak. So where is my potential peak and how closely are those peaks spaced for oxidation and reduction? If we look at cycling, we observe something very interesting. The hydrated material starts out, so that's the, the black series of dots, starts out at very high capacity but fades pretty quickly. The green dots are my 500 material. It's very stable in terms of fade, but the capacity is also about a third. And interestingly, the compromised material was the NBO 300 where we were able to start out with relatively high capacity, not as quite as high as the hydrated material, but then it would be much more stable than the hydrated material. And so we were interested in understanding why that was the case. We studied the, the all materials using something called X-ray absorption spectroscopy. X-ray absorption spectroscopy allows us to determine the oxidation state of the materials, and this, uh, these also were operando studies. So we can watch the evolution of the vanadium oxidation state as the battery is functioning. And in fact, um, vanadium changing oxidation state is the, the reaction that's taking place. So we're basically reducing vanadium as we discharge. There are several phases that are formed, and I show them here. There's the parent phase, then we have the zinc hydroxide sulfate. Zinc hydroxide sulfate is important because that told us that actually there's a pH change taking place inside the battery. What's happening is that there's proton insertion. The electrolyte becomes more basic, and we precipitate a solid. And then zinc vanadium oxide is a zinc insertion material. Um, this is a shout out to one of my collaborators, Professor Amy Marshallock. She's really been a pioneer in developing something called energy dispersive X-ray diffraction. So again, we use a working battery. We use a small 20 micron X-ray beam, move the battery through the beam, and then we can spatially and temporally resolve where is the, elect where is the reaction happening. And these are the x-ray results for the 300 degree material. And I won't go through the details here, other than to show you we have the results on the 500 degree material as well. And I think it's more apparent here. As we charge and discharge, we can map where these various phases form and what's taking place inside the battery. And what we find is that for the 500 degree material, we're really only accessing the very surface layers um, of the, the material itself with limited amount of CHS formation. With the 300 degree material, we're accessing much more of the active material and the active battery. Um, so we're getting much more complete utilization. And with the porous electrodes that we designed, the reactivity throughout the electrode was fairly uniform. So this was more a material issue than, a, than an electrode issue. Um, I will point out that the non-annealed material, and this is a study that we have ongoing now, just begins to dissolve. <laughs> so it's amorphous enough that it starts to dissolve in the electrolyte, and that contributes to the fate that we're seeing. So let me move on to my last example here. This example has to do with zinc manganese oxide batteries. So manganese oxide comes in various forms, and the drugstore batteries that you buy, you know, alkaline batteries, um, are zinc manganese oxide. They're a different form of manganese oxide. But what we were interested in was, is it possible to make zinc manganese oxide batteries rechargeable. Zinc is pretty cheap, manganese oxide is pretty cheap, manganese oxide is also fairly environmentally friendly. And of course, you know, as good researchers, we started off looking into the literature 
And we were intrigued by this two by two tunnel because this two by two tunnel structure of manganese oxide, the tunnel is big enough to accommodate a, a zinc cation. But when we looked further in the literature, well, people have in fact tried to use zinc alpha manganese oxide for rechargeable batteries. But there are reports of many, many different types of reactions. Oh, zinc is inserting. Oh no, it's proton insertion. Oh, actually, manganese oxide is turning to something else. It's a chemical conversion reaction. There were reports that said that the tunneled structure goes to layered structure and then goes back to a tunneled structure. So we thought, this is very odd. You know, the, the very talented scientists are reporting seemingly the same experiment with multiple outcomes. So we decided to try to understand this further to understand what was happening. So um, these manganese oxide studies um, were done by my um, collaborator, uh, Professor Kenneth Takeuchi, and you might guess Kenneth Takeuchi is also my husband. Um, he's really a very talented, very uh, synthetic chemist and experimentalist in general. So the first thing was making the tunneled material and characterizing it very carefully so we had a phase pure material. Next thing was starting the electrochemistry and we observed that the electrochemistry is quite different in cycle one and subsequent cycles. So we isolated samples of the electrodes after charge and discharge and we did x-ray absorption studies. And if you remember, I mentioned before, x-ray absorption is very useful in determining oxidation state of transition metals. So we determined the oxidation state of the manganese oxide in the charged and discharged condition, and then tried to relate it to the electrochemistry. And while in the vanadium case, the electron count added up, we can account for the oxidation state of the vanadium. In the manganese oxide case, we could not. We're getting more electrochemistry than the oxidation state change of the manganese oxide accounts for. So Kenna had a very clever suggestion and said, look, what you've got to do is study this operando. You've got to look at the cathode but don't look at the cathode in isolation. So a very, um, this was actually a collaboration between Ken Takeuchi and David Bach, uh, who's a Brookhaven scientist, to design a, an operando cell, and I'm showing it as a little cylinder, and what you can see is that it's stacked. So we've got the cathode on top with you know, current collector, we've got a separator in between, and then we've got the zinc anode on the bottom, and what we're doing is X-ray fluorescence mapping. So that means we're looking for a specific element. And if you look at the middle picture, everything that's bright means there's a lot of it present. And what we're doing is mapping zinc. So the zinc anode is very bright. The electrolyte contains dissolved zinc, so you can see that's kind of bright yellow. Even the cathode is porous enough that there's some electrolyte present, meaning some zinc ions present. So instead of being dark red, it's kind of, you know, a little bit orangish. The far right-hand map is manganese edge. So what we're mapping there is the fresh cell, and that whole layer is basically the manganese cathode. So that's what we're seeing is the manganese cathode. So the next set of experiments was mapping the cell but in an intermittent electrochemical process. So what we're doing is we're discharging the cell, then we pause. Then we're discharging the cell, then we pause, and then we keep going. So think of it as applying pulse, weight, pulse, weight, pulse, weight. And we saw something pretty incredible. If you look at the maps on the top, that bright white yellow spot is, you know, the sections is the cathode. But as we continued with the discharge, what we saw is more and more manganese going into the electrolyte layer. So this meant that the manganese was in fact dissolving 
into the electrolyte level, in, in, into the electrolyte. And that was part of the electrochemical process. So the next step was actually to cycle um, a, a battery uh, while we were m doing the microfluorescence maps. And I think, unfortunately, my video, I checked it earlier, <laughs> doesn't work, but let me describe. So what we're able to see is as the battery discharges and charges, we could see the manganese intensity in the electrolyte layer increase during discharge and decrease during charge. So this not only said that manganese dissolution is a key part of the electrochemistry, but deposition is as well. So what we wanted to do was quantify this, so not just a qualitative observation, but a quantitative observation of the um, dissolution deposition. So he established a calibration curve uh, using multiple concentrations of dissolved manganese in the electrolyte, and then tracked and quantified based on the microfluorescence uh, uh, behavior, micro X-ray fluorescence behavior, the amount of dissolved manganese that's in the electrolyte and compared it to the electrochemistry. And what we observed was that if we quantify it, the dissolution of manganese and the manganese uh, concentration, the electrolyte, is really the dominant uh, electrochemical mechanism that's taking place. So what's happening here is on reduction of the manganese 4 and manganese 3, when it's reduced to manganese 2, the manganese plus 2 goes into the aqueous electrolyte layer as a hydrated um, cation and then remains in the electrolyte layer until the charge step where the manganese II is oxidized and then redeposits on the cathode. And it's this mechanism that helps rationalize why there are so many disparate reports in the literature that in fact it is changing phase, it is changing structure. And if you look at things in isolation that it's hard if not impossible, to see the whole um, sequence taking place simultaneously. So this gives you a picture kind of at the molecular level of what's happening. We start with zinc, alpha manganese oxide. Upon reduction, we form manganese plus two that dissolves in the electrolyte. In this case, we're forming zinc hydroxysulfate. This is a precipitation, so this also tells us that there has to be associated um, proton insertion into the manganese oxide to precipitate uh, ZHS. On charge, the manganese II is oxidized. The ZHS, as the pH becomes more acidic, the ZHS dissolves. And we end up with two things. We end up with a layered zinc manganese oxide as a charge product, as well as an alpha manganese oxide. <coughs> Sorry. But in this case, it no longer has intact tunnels. <coughs> the material has become a partially layered structure due to the disintegration of some of the tunnels. <coughs> so a, a very recent paper that Ken published uh, took this challenge one step further. In the first experiment, if you remember, we looked at the isolated solid uh, cathode material. In the second experiment, what we were doing was mapping um, the concentration in the electrolyte. But this recent experiment combined both, where in fact, um, simultaneously we, we were measuring X-ray absorption spectroscopy of both um, the, the solid cathode material as well as the liquid contribution simultaneously. And we were able to do multi-phase multi fitting where we could fit um, the contribution from the solution as well as the contribution from the solid 
because really, in order to understand the system more fully, um, we needed information both about the solid contribution as well as um, the liquid contribution. Um, in conjunction with our X-ray absorption spectroscopy study, we used X-ray diffraction, we used uh, transmission electron microscopy, uh, selected area electron diffraction, and Roman. And this is just a comment, perhaps uh, more to the graduate students and students uh, than to the faculty, because I'm sure the faculty already know this. When you're dealing with a very complex system, often having multiple characterization methods is necessary because the multiple characterization methods, if they all end up pointing in the same direction, then we have much more confidence than in fact what we've identified by a single characterization method is representative of what's happening for, for the entire system. So we found that um, spectroscopy, uh, diffraction, and microscopy all led us to the same conclusion, which was um, um, certainly gratifying. So when we look at the combined mechanism, what we're seeing overall is the transformation of the cathode material um, into zinc manganese oxide and the precipitated ZHS phase. On charge, we recovered manganese oxide in two different phases. Um, some of the original tunnel structure remains, but then we do recover a layered structure as the charge progresses because much of the, the dissolved material doesn't redeposit in the same phase that it was originally formed. It redeposits in, uh, in a new phase uh, structure. Uh, we tested this mechanism in a series of electrolytes using sulfate, um, acetate, triflate, and this general mechanism holds true independent of the anion that's, that's present. The, the anions lead to different levels of cell efficiency, but generally the mechanisms were pretty universal uh, across these different electrolyte systems. So let me summarize here and actually um, end, uh, end on time. Uh, as you can tell from, from the presentation, uh, various size domains really do play a role. Uh, as simple as energy storage seems, uh, these systems are very complex, and they do involve a combination of uh, chemistry, material science, but also um, mechanical factors that end up being very significant in terms of not only the, des the design, but the, the ability of these systems to continue to function effectively. Um, transport through, three, through thick three-dimensional electrodes is possible. Understanding characterization and how to readily uh, uh, follow the transport mechanisms through operando methods has been something that you know, we believe we've been able to contribute to. And in terms of operando studies, particularly the manganese oxide studies, the information that we learned was pretty transformational, that these were really the first direct observations of this dissolution deposition mechanism that was taking place um, inside these batteries. So let me acknowledge first my colleagues and collaborators, um, Professor Ken Takeuchi, Professor Amy Marshallock in the uh, highlight in the circles. Um, this picture is uh, just before COVID, so many of the students um, in our collective research group, um, our collective research collaboration have graduated and I've listed uh, our new members across the bottom. Uh, we do have students from chemical engineering, material science, as well as chemistry, so we have a very multidisciplinary activity and involve actively um, staff, scientific staff from Brookhaven National Lab as well. And I'd like to thank the uh, financial support, particularly from the Department of Energy, um, as well as um, Mercedes-Benz, New York State, and several of our students have graduate research fellowships. So thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Esther, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Well, thank you very much for a very uh, inspiring lecture. I have one question. You mentioned at the very beginning uh, to achieve carbon neutral by 2050, nearly everything needs to be electrified. How do you see hydrogen play in the picture? Oh, or what a great question. You know, we've been talking about that all day today. <laughs> um, my view is that the challenge we have in front of us is so big that, that um, many forms of technology are, are going to be important. I'm not sure that any one technology can solve all of the problems quickly enough. So can hydrogen solve everything? Maybe not. Can it play an important role? I believe so. You know, we, we also talk about um, nuclear power. I think nuclear power can also play an important role. But it's like, it's like anything. I think that the technology that's best suited to the specific application and the location so um, I used to live near Buffalo, New York, and of course in Buffalo, we're very privileged because we're close to Niagara Falls. So the majority of the power is hydropower, so it's already pretty clear, uh, pretty clean. But um, now I live near New York City, about an hour away. Well, there's no place <laughs> to build a dam and you know, power uh, New York City. So New York City, likely it's gonna be powered by a combination of uh, wind, uh, offshore wind, maybe solar. Um, hydrogen may play a role in terms of um, storage, um, may play a role in terms of electricity generation through things like, you know, fuel cells, you know, um, hydro hydrogen can be formed by electrolyzers. But there's significant technology challenges there too. Hydrogen is very, uh, if, if you're working at hydrogen, you know, it's a very small molecule that can move through almost anything <laughs> pretty effectively. So, but can it play a role? I, I think so. Yeah, an important role. Thank you. Quite cool. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks for the trip. <laughs> Thanks for the terrific talk. So, um, you showed these beautiful characterizations on many different length scales. I'm curious about the complementary synthetic control that's necessary to take action on these different length scales. Can you comment about where, where you think major gaps exist? That, that's, that's also an outstanding question, and that's something we, we think about a lot because um, the challenge with something like, for example, transmission electron microscopy is you're typically looking at one particle, one segment of a particle. And the, the risk is, even though the data is beautiful, is it representative of anything in the bulk? So we're, we're very careful about synthetic control. And I think you know, Ken Takeuchi, who is really a, a synthetic inorganic chemist, um, pays a lot of attention to developing methods that are highly controllable where we can control not only the structure in, tel in terms of you know, the molecular arrangement, but things like uh, crystallite size, morphology, because all of those end up affecting the electrochemistry. So we're also very careful about lot, let's, let's say synthetic lot control, and making sure that if we're trying to compare a diversity of techniques, particularly if these techniques um, give information at multiple length scales that we are, in fact, looking at representative materials. And th your question is on point because that is not easy to do. <laughs> and, but if you don't do that, if you don't have a common source of materials, then the conclusions you draw can be pretty disparate. So, for example, in our Energy Frontier Research Center, um, one of the materials we were studying was a conversion material, uh, magnetite, FE304. And we had uh, a consistent group 
synthesizing the magnetite for all of the studies across the center because we knew that if somebody used a commercial sample and somebody made their own, comparing the results would be very challenging to know that those results really had anything to do with other results. So uh, absolutely, word to the wise, you have to have consistent input materials to make sense of your, of your data. Uh, I think I'm not a good moderator. I, I should have asked you uh, to please uh, state your name too for our guest, right? So uh, I do that with the next person. Introduce yourself and then you go with the question, okay? Okay, I'm Deva. I'm a visiting assistant professor in mechanical engineering. So I'm from the heat transfer background. Um, presently, all lithium ion batteries, you know, you need thermal management at the cell level, module, battery level. Do you, in your opinion, do you see a future where thermal management is not needed and everything is taken care of by electrochemistry. You know, when we started out, that was really our objective. What, what we wanted to do was understand at a fundamental level what are the sources of heat and to see if we could design materials and systems to change that balance. In other words, to have more productive electrical work and less generated heat. I think it is possible to change the balance depending upon how the, what material you pick, um, how the electrodes are designed, how the cell is designed, and importantly, linking that with how it's utilized. But I don't think it's ever going to drop to zero. I, I don't think your career is in threat. I think we're, <laughs> in other words, managing that heat and managing it really carefully, it's going to continue uh, to be of critical importance moving forward because, uh, you know, th the batteries degrade, you know, when the temperature goes up. I mean, it helps transport, but degradation is also accelerated. So managing that heat is, is going to remain critical. There are things that can be done to minimize it, but it's not going to be zero. I don't think so, especially not with lithium ion. Not going to happen. Thank you for the beautiful talk, uh, Esther. And I'm Jeff Greeley from Chemical Engineering. Um, so I, I was uh, fascinated by the last example with the, uh, the zinc manganese oxide. And the, the transformation that the material goes through is incredibly complex. So I guess I, I have maybe just a two-part question. The first is, you know, in retrospect, if you had perfect thermodynamic knowledge of this system, is that a transformation that you would have been able to predict uh, based on thermodynamics, phase diagrams, or is it more of a kinetically controlled process? And I guess if it's kinetically controlled, I'm just curious to, uh, uh, to get your perspective on whether you think it'll ever be possible to, uh, to get some intuition about when to expect those types of dramatic transformations a priori. It, it, it's a really good question. Um, I can tell you what is kinetically controlled for sure because we've seen this in other materials. For example, we've seen this in the sodium vanadium oxide case, which is an example of a, let me call it more clean insertion mechanism, whereas this is complicated by, um, you know, initial proton insertion followed by dissolution. With the sodium vanadium oxide case, the kinetics determine whether it's proton insertion or zinc insertion. And um, if you drive something qu quickly, right, try to go to high rate, perhaps not surprisingly, proton insertion is definitely favored. Protons are small, they're mobile, you can you know, jam it between those layers. If you go slowly enough, there is still some proton insertion that takes place, but zinc, zinc insertion becomes a more significant process. So the, the complexity here is that the details of the mechanism, let's put it this way, now we know this, when we started this, we didn't know. <laughs> so in fact, the colleague that we talked about, um, uh, Dr. Ping Liu, is trying to now back up and look at this more from a thermodynamic perspective and say, well, if we have this material and we are going to try to do zinc insertion, is that reasonable? Are we, you know, if we try to do proton insertion, is that reasonable? So. 
this is one case where I think we needed some experiment to help define the direction to, to, to look. But I think now the theory then will help us guide, you know, like, okay, well, now where do the next set of experiments need to go to help, you know, validate that theory or perhaps give us insight into how to make these systems more robust or more reversible based on the thermodynamics? It's a great question. I will say that uh, for many years I worked, my research really focused on lithium and lithium ion, and lithium and lithium ion, it has its own set of complexities for sure, but the one thing you know is the charge carrier. You pretty much know that it's lithium ion, right? Once you go to these aqueous systems, you no longer even know what the charge carrier is. You know, it can be zinc, it can be proton, you know, so it, it, it adds another set of complexities that, that lithium batteries uh, don't have. Right. Yes. Hi. Uh, hello. Thank you for the lecture today. Um, I wanted to, like, know um, about your charge characteristics and, like, solid-state batteries. Um, and so you mentioned that aqueous batteries are, it's really difficult to characterize their charge characteristics. I was wondering if we did like um, solid state batteries, it would be um, easier to characterize the charge characteristics? Yeah. So, so gr great question. Um, I just attended a, a several day symposium um, last week actually, uh, where many, many of the talks dealt with um, solid state batteries. And I think, you know, it, 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 many um, of the research, the researchers have been successful in characterizing the charge carrier. So in some cases, they know. What's more challenging to understand is uh, the exact role of the interface, because the interface between your active electrode and the solid electrolyte can be highly complex. And also the role of not only the mobile ion, but the role of, let's say, the, the surrounding structures, you know, that are, that are allowing that mobile ion to, to move. Um, because the, as much as we think there, everything's static, it isn't always. So I hesitate to say that something's easy, because, because it never is. Um, but it, I think my point about water was just that uh, it can be two positive charge carriers. In most solid state systems, the anion can play a role, the cation can play a role, but it's typically not more than one cation that's the active charge carrier. So, but I think that's unique to, you know, kind of lithium, maybe sodium systems. Okay. All right, I got the signal. I'm going to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you very much <laughs> one more time, Esther, for the wonderful presentation and being available for our question and answers. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. No, five minutes. Five-minute five minute break, and then we start with the panel. We just uh, rearrange and go straight into the panel. So thank you, and uh, just uh, stay put. More to come.